now that I'm between a bunch of people on their weekend, um, I have story time, essentially. So you had Andrew Vanderstock um, talked with you all a little bit earlier today and gave you a bit of an overview of the top 10. And my job today is tasked to give you an idea of how we got to the top 10. So bear with me. This has, um, let's say, several hundred hours over the last year condensed into about 25 minutes. So we will have to give you some stories. So first, I would like to actually thank Hugo Costa, the uh, iconography for the top 10 for this 20th anniversary is amazing. Um, for the first time, we actually get to provide our own icons for the top 10. And I, I love them. I, I think they're really good and it'll help us carry the message through. So the question is, how, how did we get here? And it's a, uh, it took us a while. It's a long journey. Um, I won't give you all the details. You don't have time for that. But I will get you an idea of what it took for us to get through this. So one of the things, like Jeff Williams mentioned earlier, was one of the biggest things we can do to improve security is have transparency. And so one of the things we wanted to do was be able to share how we got to what we picked as the top 10 risk categories in the top 10 for 2021. So as we went through building it, we had these core principles. So one thing we had to remember is the top 10 is a baseline. It's not a ceiling. So not everything has to be in it. But at the same time, we also realized that over the years, some people don't go past the top 10. So we need to make sure that it's good, it's actionable, and it has good solid coverage. Data is good, but it's not everything. The data that we look at is looking in the past. So it is not necessarily representative of today. It is what we managed to figure out um, potentially weeks, months, or even years in the past. So that's part of the reason why we use a community survey as well, because there is a lag between when humans figure out we have a particular type of vulnerability to where they can reliably test for it, to when they can build it into automation, to when automation runs at enough scale that it shows up in the data. The other core principle we have is stability is good. So some people have asked us why the top 10 only updates every three to four years. And one of the things that we understand with the top 10 that is incredibly humbling and we take incredibly seriously is that whatever we pick for these top 10 risk categories is going to start in motion 10 to hundreds of thousands of hours of labor over the next some odd years. This is not something we take lightly. And it's also something that why we don't update it on an annual basis or even update it live. Because could you imagine trying to build training content or drill, build standards or build tools or build anything against the top 10 and it never stops changing? So if we change it too often, people will basically quit using it because there is a point and there is a place for things that change quite frequently or just continuously. But there is also a place for things that provide foundational stability for other people to build on. The other principle we have is raise minimum bar. So we need to, our goal is in this position of this project is to raise that bar. Um, we need to further improving security across the industry, across the community. And if we don't raise the bar, then who is? Um, we also want to make sure we drive the right behavior. We don't want to drive pure compliance behavior. We don't want to drive checkbox behavior. We want to drive behavior that actually improves software security across the industry. And one other that we thought about um, this year around that came up was looking at root cause over symptom. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through this. But one other thing I wanted to show you is um, I also work on the software assurance maturity model lifecycle or the software assurance maturity model or OWASAM. And to give you an idea of the size of scope or scale between these two. So this is a blown up image of SAM 
um, that I put together at one point. So typically the top 10 fits here. The top 10 might fit in software requirements, might fit in dependencies, um, it may, and it comes in the test cases. So of the direct impact, it's usually in those places. It gets used sometimes in policy and standards, it gets used in training and awareness. With the recent updates to 2021, we also now have a say in where you need to help improve your deployment process. Um, a little bit of secret management, build process. And with the addition of A4 and secure design, now we're touching a little bit on architectural design and threat modeling, app risk profiling. But at the end of the day, we still, within the top 10 itself, touch a fraction of how broad secure software security actually is. So please understand this is a starting point. So as we look at how, what we did for data, uh, I have to stop and just say thank you because without these 12 organizations who put out volunteer hours to gather data, to organize it, to send it to me, to answer my questions about their data, to respond some more, and then a 13th anonymous donor, thank you so much. This is the largest data set we've ever had related to this kind of information. And there's so much more to glean from it beyond just what we used for the top 10. So it's something that I look forward to being able to dig through for the next few years. But I need to say thank you because if you all had not contributed this data, then your top 10 would be subject to our whims on whatever we felt like at the time. So with the data, so we're continuing what we did with 2017. So in 2017, we switched over from incidence rate. We switched over from frequency to incidence rate. So frequency is not really a good way to measure impact to a population. So incidence rate more comes from epidemiology, where you're looking at what percentage of the population was affected by something in a given time period. The other thing we changed, or one of the things we changed in 2021 was we kind of opened the floodgates for CWE map data. So in 2017, it was the original data call prescribed between 30 and 35 CWEs. And we asked organizations, send us what you have related to these CWEs that we prescribed for you. Versus in 2021, we said, send us everything you find. Whatever you map stuff to, send it to us and we'll deal with it. So a minimum level data request that we asked for is we said, please send us a year. Please send us what CWE you tested for. Please tell us the population that you tested, how many applications were tested for the CWE, and then how many apps were found to have at least one instance. So again, if you had 4,000 instances across that scripting in the app, I want a one, one app. This helps us understand like what percentage of the population was actually impacted by types of vulnerabilities. It does not tell us whether or not the vulnerability was a systemic issue or a one-off, but in our case for the top 10, it, that's not a big deal. We don't really need to know that type of information. So we ran into an interesting thing when we got CWEs from organizations. So on this bottom, we have 13 organizations. So only one CWE did all 13 organizations tell us they actually tested for. Only one CWE did 10 organizations test for. So this is the part where I really, really wish I was actually in front of the audience because then I could ask you this question and you all could yell it back at me. But what do you think the number one CWE tested for was? So that's CWE 79. And if you pay, if you've dug in the CWEs before, CWE 79 is, you guessed it, cross-site scripting. Shocker, right? Um, the second one is actually CWE 200. Now, CWE 200 isn't quite as well known by people, um, at least not in terms of we memorized its number, and its exposure of sensitive information to an unauthorized attacker. So the interesting thing is with CWE 200, and this is the same, this gets me back to that point of root cause versus symptom. CWE 200 doesn't tell me why. It says, hey, you coughed up sensitive data to somebody who wasn't authorized to see it, but doesn't tell me 
why that happened. It doesn't tell me that there was a lack of a control. It doesn't tell me if there was a broken control. It doesn't tell me what caused it. It just told me what happened. So it's an interesting challenge as we walk through trying to figure out root cause versus symptom in terms of some of the CWEs are symptom as well. And not all of them are root cause. So for number three, or for three of them, we have 327, which is a use of broken or risky cryptographic algorithm. 89, which everybody should know what 89 is, and that's SQL injection. And then 352, which is CSRF. The other side of this, which is a really interesting challenge, was of the almost 400 CWEs that were contributed, over 75% of them were only tested for at three or fewer orgs. This tells me that at this point, we do not, as an industry, we have not standardized on what we call our test cases or what CWEs we map our tests to. And this makes the data collection quite an interesting challenge when we try and collate and correlate all of these type, different types of test results. So like I said, also, it's not purely the data because again, the data is looking back in the past. So what we do, and we did this in 2017, and we did, did it again in 2021, is we have a community survey. And we go through and we say, hey, tell us a little bit about yourself because we want to understand the demographic. But then we also ask, hey, within the top 10, so for um, a certain set of CWEs, do essentially a ranked voting of one top one through four that you have and tell us which ones that you feel should be in the top 10 that are unlikely to show up in the data. And the results of the survey this time around was without a shadow of a doubt, we were told that SSRF was important. SSRF is a really interesting anomaly because we had testing for SSRF and it showed that there was a really low incidence rate for it. But the community said, hey, by the way, the data may not be accurate, SSRF is important. So there might be a couple of reasons for this. We don't know exactly why, but it may be that SSRF is hard to test for and we have not found all the good instance of it. It may be that all of the media from breaches from SSRF made it top of mind for people. And they decided that, hey, this is what I've heard of most recently for the last year or two, so it must be really important. Um, we're not entirely sure, but what we know is as a result of the survey, SSRF is in the top 10. The second one was unmaintained third-party components. And in 2017, there actually wasn't a CWE for this. The only CWE related to vulnerable components was a CWE for the top 10 itself. Um, so thankfully it exists now, but that one was through the data itself. We had enough data from testing that says this is a problem. So then number three was insufficient logging and monitoring. So that was a bit controversial in 2017, where people said, hey, by the way, um, you're gonna break. We had a few people tell us that we were gonna completely break the top 10 and make people walk away from it because of picking insufficient logging and monitoring because it's really, really hard to test for it. Like, how do you know what is sufficient logging and monitoring? So how do you test for insufficient? Um, but at the same time, three years later, we had an absolutely resounding level of support saying, you know what, this really is important. Um, so through the rest of these, we've had most of the rest of them in the survey found their way into the top 10 in one category or another. Because like I said, we had 400 CWEs this time. So we ended up with a lot more CWEs of coverage within the risk categories in the top 10. So we're here, we're trying to manage likelihood. So if you remember the risk equation of likelihood times impact. So we're looking at the likelihood, um, incidence rate was essentially the number of apps we found a CWE in divided by the number of apps tested. But then we ran into some really interesting scenarios because of the data that we had. And so we had, for instance, CWE 552. So files or directories accessible to external parties. Has an incidence rate of about 56% which at first blush seems really high. So we dug into it a little more and we found that hey, it was found in 6,200 apps, but only 11,000 apps were tested. So of the overall population of testing, only 2% of the entire contributed population was actually tested for the CWE. 
So the overall incidence rate was somewhere just over 1% of the population, but we don't know. And so we realized we need to balance out some of these um, smaller, more niche CWEs that were tested with trying to figure out what's the level of assurance that this is an accurate incidence rate. So if only 2% of the app was 2% of the population was actually tested for CWE 552, I don't have a really high assurance rate that that is a statistically significant chunk of the population. So we added in a factor that considers coverage. So what percentage of the population was actually tested for that vulnerability? So that gave us some weight to whether or not that incident, how accurate that incidence rate actually was. So like I said, though, we have likelihood times impact. Incidence rate and coverage helps us with likelihood, but we still need impact. In 2017, impact was exploit and technical in impact. We also use detectability, which technically is more into likelihood. But honestly, the data source for this exploit information was essentially the collective experience of the leadership team. We had no data to work off of that. So it was essentially a five-hour marathon call where we argued back and forth over what is the general level of exploit or impact of the average of a particular type of risk category, which is ridiculously difficult to try and figure out what a typical vulnerability is because we could always come up with edge cases of how horrible or how neutered a particular vulnerability was. So in 2021, since we had so much data related to likelihood, we wanted to see if we could use data again for impact because we didn't want to dilute the data set that we had by making the other half of the equation basically licking our finger and sticking it in the wind. So we decided after some digging around that it might work to use the subscores of exploit and impact from CVSS. So we went over to our neighborhood OWASP dependency check project and we set it up and we told it to update its database from the MVD. We pulled that database out queried it, and then found that of the CWEs, there were 241 CWEs mapped to the CVEs within that data set. So, but we had almost 400. So not all of our CWEs ever had a CVE issued against it or mapped against it. And one of the interesting things is one example is vulnerable components. We will never have a CVE mapped against a vulnerable component CWE because it will be mapped against the actual base problem that was in the component itself. So if we look at the CWEs that were mapped to this data, we find that there's somewhere around 125,000 of them. Um, but 35,000 of them were marked with other or no info. And, to the, and I haven't had a chance to dig through it. I'm not entirely sure why there's an option to pick other versus no info. They essentially end up with the same thing where we don't know what CWE that's, that CVE actually matches to. So the largest individual CWE is our friend CV, CWE79. Cross-site scripting is something that usually dominates top 10 lists because of a high frequency and it's really easy to find. CWE 119 is interesting. Um, if you play with web apps, you don't run into it a lot. It has to do with buffer overflows and memory management. CWE 20 is a generic CWE for uh, input validation. And then you have our friend 89, which is SQL injection again. 200, which was our sensitive data exposure. Um, 264, which is a general category for access control. Um, doesn't really tell us what happened, just unauthorized access. Um, and then this data tails off really fast. So there are only 20 CWEs that ma were mapped here that actually had more than 1,000 CVEs against it. There are only 70 CWEs that actually have more than 100 CVEs. And of our data set, 65 CWEs only had one or two CVEs mapped to it. So the other interesting thing in the CVSS scoring was version two versus version three of CVSS. So if you've done any defect management, you know the fun that you deal with when you get into V2 versus V3. And just looking at the graph, you can see this is interesting because 
CVSS2 has a range that looks like it's between three and 10, but CVSS3 is between essentially one and six. Part of that reason is because they changed the formula between the two and they changed the bounds that the score, subscores could actually be. So if you take all that weighting into account, you also find an interesting trend that in CVSS version three, within the impact subscore, on average, it scores almost a point and a half higher within version three of CVSS um, versus version two for the same type of vulnerabilities. So also notice if you go left from right, the amplitude seems to go up and that has to do, I believe, with the number of actual vulnerabilities um, actually goes down. So the fewer you have, the harder it is to have somewhat of a normal setup. So we looked at exploit as well and all of a sudden this was even more dramatic of a difference. So in CVSS V2, you're somewhere between four and 10. And in V3, your raw scores are between one and four. And we're trying to, so we realized that that has to do with the difference. In V2, they let the scores go all the way up to 10, but then they would basically multiply times 0.4. They take only 40% of the score. And in V3, they just capped it at four. And they said, you know what? We're not going to do it that way. We'll just do it slightly differently. So overall, the difference between them was have about... Uh, almost half a point lower on average for export, which is also kind of interesting on that setup. So we have this data porridge, right? So to calculate risk, we now have incidence rate and testing coverage for likelihood. We have exploit and impact for impact. And so we kind of sprinkle total occurrences on it as well, because there is some significance to how many different apps were actually found to have particular types of CWVs. So we wanted to bring that in too, because that has an impact. So our not so secret formula, so this is essentially what we used. So we went through in between incidents and coverage and exploit and impact and occurrences. We weighted them, went through and essentially we spent weeks working through different scenarios. And we have, we looked at average and we looked at high watermark trying to figure out what makes the most sense from this data. So trying to balance the data with the decades of expertise we have as a leadership team in terms of does this seem to represent, would this drive appropriate behavior? And then the second half below here is I broke it out because I wanted to see depending on what part of the formula, how did it contribute to the overall score? So for some things like broken access control and cryptographic failures, they have most of their score comes from incidents. We find more of them. They have generally decent coverage um, and then their number of occurrences are fairly high. The exploit and impact don't weigh as much in their part of the formula. On the other hand, there are things that may have a higher impact but we don't find as often. So there's our eternal dilemma of trying to go between you know, what's worse, a whole lot of low impact or a few high impact? And as humans, we're kind of bad about risk management in that space. Um, so it becomes an interesting challenge to figure out how do we balance all of this? But at the end of the day, as much as we do all of this, if you're in the top 10, you're in the top 10. Whether you're number four or you're number five or you're number eight, you're still in the top 10. So where do we go from here? So looking at how we built this, um, we need to get more consistent with CWEs. We have, in the data, we have a number of retired and archived that were still being used. Um, just don't map to them. So, um, try to use root cause CWEs as much as possible. We have some that were completely mapped to categories. There is no information there. We just have a category. We don't know the details of it. Um, one of the main things that we're hoping to do within the top 10 is fix this stuff at the language and framework level. Uh, we're hoping to drive this change. So CSRF in 2007 was added to the top 10. Uh, it, almost every single web app was susceptible to CSRF in 2007. So now in 2021, we're looking at single digit percentage susceptibility. 
So just a small, tiny fraction of web apps are still susceptible to CSRF. And typically, the more modern languages, we don't have that problem. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is don't just shift left. Um, and you've heard that from a few people. We need to do more. We need to expand and assimilate security. It needs to be just part of a mindset and part of everything else we do. And the other thing is, is we have a lot of security outside of code. Code is really important. And, and, and I do share uh, Mark's, Mark Curfee's note where I went looking for the secure development guidelines and was disappointed to see that we hadn't messed with them in 11 years. Um, would love to see that come back. But at the same time, we can't only focus on code. We have to focus on stuff that's outside of that level of automation and go to the human part as well. But thank you. Um, again, this is, there are so many more stories to tell with what we've done with this, but at the same time, you know, I get my 25 minutes and I'm at my 25 minutes. So thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity.